Okay, hi everyone. So today we'll be continuing on with Web Development Part 2 of a two-part series for our workshops. Yes. So, maybe I'll do a quick flash recap of what we kind of did. Like, like we managed to kind of make use of um, HTML as well as CSS to create a simple web application. We've also learned how to make use of the different app routes, receive requests from like different um, websites. So like if let's say I want to enter uh, my name here, John for instance, I would get um, my own personalized um, kind of web page. And I'll also be able to kind of see tasks and add tasks. Yeah. And this request that we have just made is called a get request when we first join the website. And when we send our data, it's a post request. So that's what we learned last week. However, if let's say I want to do more complicated stuff, like let's say if I want to have all my tasks and my descriptions, right? Um, while maybe I could make use of say a simple dictionary, like say um, having tasks, then maybe I create a dictionary. So my dictionary would kind of store um, items, right? So the dictionary would be something like having say a task and then maybe a, a descri description and then so on and so forth. And I have a bunch of other items, like say someone's name and then stuff. Um, this might work, but the problem is, especially if you get like, have a lot of things you need to store, like say names, you have descriptions, you have tasks. Um, sooner or later you rest, you have a lot of dictionaries to kind of store all this stuff. And secondly, if you want to have queries or operations to kind of search up stuff, it's not very fast with a dictionary. So that's where SQL kind of come kind of come in come in uh. Yeah, so that's why um when you we use SQL often is to kind of um, speed up the searches because dictionaries are sort of slow and also you might need to perform some complex like operations uh, with SQL. Yeah, so without further ado, let's um learn like SQL and I'll be passing my time over to uh J Jamie, yeah. Uh so yeah, so now I'll be talking about the basics of database design. Yeah. So for the rest of this workshop, you'll learn basically how databases are structured, how to create and add information to a database, how to retrieve information from your database that you have created, and lastly, how to integrate this database into the web app that you have built previously last week. Okay, so firstly, I think one, one thing that you might be asking is what exactly are databases? So databases basically are a collection of structure information. So it's really just data that has structure to it. And the, basically the need for databases and structured, a way of structuring data arose out of the fact that as more people are using the internet nowadays, there's more data being stored on the internet. So as such, the world is becoming, as the world is becoming increasingly data driven, we need more efficient and more um, like easier ways to manage the data that we are dealing with in our applications. So well, now there are many, actually many database formats out there, but the most common one tends to be relational database systems. They're the, one of the oldest and also one of the most commonly used today, and they're the main one that we're focusing on today. Yeah. Okay, so some examples of where databases can be found include YouTube, Amazon, Instagram, and actually basically any web, uh, web application that needs to store information about their users. So some examples of data that can be stored in databases include user login data, Purchase data, job listings, and more. So on. yeah. Okay, and so uh, as a person who's setting up a database, the main piece of software that you'll be using to communicate and set up the database will be a database management system. As you can see from the diagram here, it's basically the only thing that you'll be interacting with as you communicate your database. So these database systems normally have to be installed on your server or computer, but increasingly they are being uh, they are available directly on to website builders, such as 000 web hosts and stuff itself online. So it saves you the trouble of having to install such systems. And the way that you communicate and basically give commands to this database management system uh, include, uh, right, the main interface which you do that is using SQL, which is a language that we'll be teaching you about later. And as of today, there's also more and more uh, graphic user interfaces, GUIs, for these kind of systems that are available. So people, even without SQL knowledge, still can manage these databases. Yeah, so some common examples of these databases, database management systems include MySQL and SQLite. And so we'll be using SQLite for today. Yeah. 
And this is just a uh, FYI, quick FYI. This is the GUI of one of the DBMSs, PHP my admin online. So as you can see in this kind of database structure, you can actually do all the database um, queries and stuff without using SQL, You're just using the buttons here. So yeah, I guess. Okay, so now we're going a bit more into database structure. Uh, is everyone okay so far? Can I just check? If I'm going too fast and new, so I'll just tell me, yeah. Okay, so for database structure, as mentioned just now, we'll be looking at the relational database model because that's the format that SQL communicates with. So in relational database models, a database is made up of tables, which are also called relations, as you see on the right over here. And these tables contain data that you want to store in your, in your web app, or if you want to access these data from your web app as well. And so the reason why these the reason why the database model is called relational database model is because, as you can see over here, there are uh, basically there are relations that are drawn between the different tables, and they are also going to be declared in your database. So, as of this juncture, as I mentioned, like you might be wondering why it is so important that we need to know how the database is structured if there's going to be the ones that we just need to take and insert information from them. Here's yes, because the reason is that as you organize the data into these tables, you need to know what what table what data you put in what tables and also how to draw these connections between the different tables in order so you can probably call your information from these tables when you need it in your application yep okay so here are some components of the table that you might need to know the names that you might need to know so basically as mentioned before a table is sometimes also called a relation so this is the name of the table this is a just a representation the columns of the table are known as attributes and each row of a table is known as a tuple. So each tuple in the table represents one object or relation, which I'll be talking about later. So as you can see, this tuple here, for example, re represents this user called Benjamin. This one represents this user, Davidson, and so on. Okay, so the key principle of the relational database model is that all objects and relations can be modeled as tables. So you have to keep that in mind as you transfer your data over into the database. So for example, relationships in this relational database model are also separately inputted as tables. So for example, if you want to sort of take down the data of in the university of what students are enrolled in what courses, you have one table obviously for students to store their personal data, one table for courses to store course data, and you have a separate table for also the classes that students are enrolled in that includes both the student IDs and the course IDs. So that's a called a relational table. And that's basically how you declare the relationship between your data. Yeah, so as you can see over here, you see how the how you call data for, or insert data into this database from now on will be such that, for example, let's say your database system wants to get, uh, get what courses this student called Mary is studying in. So they look and see that Mary is has student ID of one, two, three. And by checking that road table, they see that they're in the course number five, six, four, and that course name is 417. Yes. Okay, yeah. So basically, the student IDs and course IDs are inputted into the relational table. So actually, I inputted an, I another slide over in the slides. You can see that later. It's basically, um, a rough guide for when you should put something as a table and when it doesn't have to be a table. Yeah. So another component of another important component that you need to know in relational database structures is the concept of a primary key. So a primary key is basically a unique identifier of each tuple. And we see what it does is that you should be able to differentiate each tuple, each row, using the primary key only. And they have to be explicitly declared when making a database, so that's very important. So for example, the way it works is that it's using a student ID. So in the case that you have two students who have the same name, using the student ID, which is the primary key, you can differentiate these two rows. So now another question might come up of that is that, which is that if you have a table, which for example over here has no clear indication of what should be the primary key, what do you do? So in that case, actually two primary, it's possible to set two attributes as your primary key. For example, in this table of um, sort of like playing cards, you need both the suit and the value of the playing card to be uh, 
to identify the card that you played. So it's possible to it is possible to set two attributes as a primary key. And you normally do that for relational tables, where over here you can see they are there are two of these sets of primary key. Yeah, and primary keys are normally declared by an underline in diagrams, just FYI. Yeah. So okay, so now I have a short exercise. So of this entire table here, uh, which attribute do you think should be the primary key? Anyone wants to answer this? Yeah, okay, so I'll just say it. Uh, in this case, it should be the NRIC, which uh, this is the American terminology for it, it's SSN. That's because um, K name obviously can't be used as a primary key because people might have the same name. Your home phone can't be used as a primary key because some people don't have home phones. Your address can't be used as a primary key because some people, like siblings, might have the same address. And you see, not everyone has an office phone, and these obviously can't be used as primary keys. Yeah. So, as a general rule, just pick the most unique, confirm to be unique identifier amongst the table. Okay, so now we're talking about the data types that are going into your table. And so, data types are important because when creating your table again, you need to explicitly specify the data type of the attribute that you are putting in over here. So, there are a lot of data types. Um, you can go to the link in the slides. There's this tells you all the data types that are available in SQLite, but generally the only ones you need to know are character, which is basically a fixed. Uh, if you are you have a complete background, you know what a string is, a fixed length string. We see a fixed, for example, 10 characters, uh, variable characters, var car, which you see any uh line of text of any length, and integer, which is just an integer. You don't need to care about the size over here because it's unlikely that you're going to exceed this amount. Yeah. So for example, over here, home phone, if we exclude the dash, it might be integer. Address should be a variable character. And yeah. So um, for those people who are from a community background, you might know that of such things called Booleans, especially in Python and such. So there's no Boolean class in SQLite, which is the main DBMS that we'll be using later. But there are in other DBMS systems. But in any case, if you want to specify like a true false kind of uh, attribute, you can just use integers and use one or zero to substitute them. Yeah. So now we have a short exercise where you've been hired by this company called YourTube to create a database for a new video sharing site. So uh, basically what I want you to do is roughly read this description and I'll give you about two to three minutes to help plan the database for this. Yeah. So your database here should just get a piece of paper and try to plan it out. Your database here should store data of users, videos, and what videos each user like or dislike. And also these additional attributes for each of these, for the users and video. Yeah, okay, here's a, not really a hint, you definitely need more than two tables for this exercise. So yeah, I'll just give you like two minutes on this. So for this exercise, you'll definitely need more than two tables. So I said, you'll need three tables at the very minimum. So the first table will be for users, where username will be the primary key. And username is a variable character. And it's the main identifier, because usernames can be unique. Then you have first name, last name, email, they're all variable characters. OK, one thing to note is that, I thought about it here, but when you create a database data, you guys should have the proper syntax. But you need to state a length, a maximum length behind each of your each of your data types. Yeah. So 2 by 5 is just a guideline. You can put anything really. So we have another table for videos where this new attribute called video ID that we have made up will be the identifying factor because we can't identify it by title and uploader. Okay, fine, title maybe, but uh it's very unwieldy because titles are very long, it's hard to compare. So video ID is something that's more standardized and easier to check. And honestly, we take all of these, uh, all these data types are fine for video ID. Either one is fine. And lastly, you have a relational table to note down which video is liked by which user. So video ID will be carried over from here. And it's the same data type as one we put previously. Username will also be carried over from here. And it's also a variable character. And lastly, we have an attribute called liked. And we see it's integer of one or zero, a true false value. So the integer will be one if the video is liked by user and will be zero if it's unliked by user. Okay, this system works because 
uh, you can only either like or dislike a video or don't like a video. Yeah, you can't um, you can't like simultaneously like and dislike a video. So this true false value works. Yeah. So an alternative answer, uh, at the bottom here, yeah, will be it's fine if you put one table for like, one table for dislike. And you basically did the same thing here, except without this column. That's also fine. But it's just that it's not ideal because in large database systems, which you probably will not be dealing with, uh, it might start to take up a lot of space. So this smaller format is generally more preferred. Also, you might notice that uh, in this likes table over here, I did not use video ID and username out in full like I did previously, but I still use these shortened forms over here. So it's just, it's not a hard rule. But as a recommendation, uh, it's best to put all attributes in the database having unique names. This is because uh, one weakness of SQL is that, for example, if I just use video ID in the likes table here and use it, use the name here, if you call up the two tables at the same time and try to sort of compare the information. Uh, the SQLs, the DBMS cannot tell apart which username is from which table. Yeah, okay, so there are ways around this, such as using aliases to name your tables, uh, which is more advanced, we won't do that later. But uh, as general rule, so that you don't get confused, so that no one gets confused, uh, it's probably easier to just put different names for your data. That's still recognizable. Uh, yeah, so database design in real life. Uh, database design is normally taken on by database engineers. And database engineers, the role of database engineers is to ensure that a database system runs very smoothly, runs smoothly and efficiently for all users in large companies, especially on a much larger scale, where you have to deal with example YouTube using millions of users. And example, and there's generally a lot more data that's taken into account. So there's gonna be a lot more work in database engineering that goes into making sure that the database is optimized and runs as smoothly as possible, takes up as little space as possible for all users. So if you're interested, there's a simple overview of some more specialized techniques that are used in database design by in actual practice and the mathematical concepts behind these are also explained over here if you are you want choose to check it out yeah, okay so now I'm actually passing on to your turn to talk about sql syntax now that you actually have some idea about the theory let's get to like the exciting part the code so first thing uh there's this link on the slides for the exercises so you can just click on it. The first thing that we need, you need to do is to obviously connect to a database. So assuming you're interacting directly with the database management system, there are some commands that you can use to do that. So the first command you see over here, this one is used in MySQL. So it does not reapply for SQLite. So if you're using SQLite, the, if you're interacting with the SQLite shell directly, what you can do is you can use .use workplace.db or whatever file that you want to use as the database. So this command will actually create a physical .db file where the database will be stored. So however, if you're using Python, you won't actually need to use this syntax at all because later they'll be showing you how to connect to a database in Python code. So next, you're connected to a database already. But before I proceed any further, let's make sure you know how to document your code. And it's always a good practice to comment your code if you're doing especially if you're doing some obscure magic or you want to tell the next developer or something about the code, which by the way is likely to be you and staring at some huge SQL monster months after you have coded it is really not fun. Yeah. So now you can go ahead and create a table using the following command. So first you have to tell SQL like what is the name of the table you want to create. Next, you must specify the columns that you want to create and the type of data that they are storing. So just to recap from earlier, some common types are integers, uh, variable characters and dates and you see that additionally there's actually some as an actual extra parameter here options so the options actually use to flex certain properties of the columns so the examples uh so the examples over here on the slide this are uh, quite self-explanatory so i won't go through them in detail again so one last thing to note is that over here you see that if not exists ex appears in a bracket this just means that this is an optional thing that you can specify for when you're creating a table. Because if a table already exists and you do not specify that, uh, SQLite will actually, or SQL will actually show an error. Yeah. 
So after you have created your table, you can add data to the table equally simply. So you just need to specify the table and the columns you want to insert into, followed by the rows of the data that you want to insert. So if you're lazy and you ignore some columns, so maybe in this case, you don't, there's more columns at the back, column three, column four, but you don't insert values for column three and four, then SQL will automatically populate these columns with their default value if they have one. Otherwise, these columns will just be initialized to now. So in case you didn't catch that, yes, here's some examples to make that clearer. So in this example, we will first create a basic table for the employees. Note that over here, we actually spell out in in full because it's a quirk of SQL like, uh, yeah. And employer ID in this case we see is a primary key and it cannot be now. So this is because it obviously must exist and will be a unique thing that we can use to identify our employees. We also note that over here, we specify auto increment. What this basically means is that you don't need to specify, or if you don't specify this employee ID when you insert employees into this table, the employer ID will automatically start counting from zero. Yeah. So after that, you have first name, last name, and you also have job title. So here, job title will show you an example of how you can specify a default value. So in this case, if the uh, default value is not specified, you just assume that the employee is a programmer. Uh, one last thing to note is that over here, you see, beside, you see there's a brace, there's brackets beside for a car, and there's a two five specified there. So as mentioned previously, this is just the maximum length of this um, string that you're storing. So it's not very, in general, just, it's just set a reasonable value that it shouldn't exceed, then it should be fine. Yeah. So over here, we see an example where we're inserting employees into the database. So over here, we insert two employees, John and Alice. So in this case, you see that even though it's only one column, you, you still specify the parentheses, otherwise you, throw, you might throw an error. Yeah. So over here, you see on the output, you see the employer ID, Oh, oops, okay, yeah, it starts counting from one. I mixed that earlier. And you see that there's no value specified. There's no default value specified for the last name. So over here, it's just none, which is because we're using Python. So it shows that. And for job title, because you also didn't specify it, it falls back onto the default value, which is programmer in this case. So, okay, let's try part one of the exercises. Yeah. So go to the uh, code app and First thing, we just need to set up the IPython SQL. So just run this first two cells and yeah, wait for it to complete. Okay, so let's look at the first example. So in this example, we'll be creating a database, but as mentioned earlier, the commands doesn't really work for uh, SQL Lite. So over here we're using because we're using IPython SQL, which is a wrapper to use allow you to type SQL in this notebook. That's a slightly different thing. So you, different syntax. So you just have to run this to connect to this database. Yeah. Yeah. So over here you see it's connected. So we're connected to university .db. So you can just continue. So that's our first example. So we see here we see how to create a table. So actually we note that the casing doesn't matter because in the slides you see that create table, if not exist, all these things are specified in caps. But over here we type them in lowercase and it's still fine. Yeah. So just go ahead and run cell and see. And see that it just outputs done, which means that the uh, operations were, were completed without any errors. Yeah. So you see that if there's without the if not exist option, you will try and you'll get error trying to rerun the cell. So I'll just go ahead and delete this for this table and let's run this cell and see what happens. So you see over here, you see as an operational error, the table stuff already exists. Yeah. So to prevent that, you can just add in this, but in most cases, you won't really need this to use this syntax. So now let's try the first, you can try the first exercise. Uh, here you can create a table for the university courses and it should have the following columns. So I think it's a quite a simple one. So I just give you around two minutes to start. So, okay, I'll just continue with this. So in this example, you want to create a table. So the first thing you type is that you type create table, and then you will need to specify the name of the table. So in this case, we'll just call this table courses. And now after this, you will need to specify the course ID, the course name and the faculty. So for the course ID is pretty simple. It's just specify the column name and then you know that the course ID, in this case, we can just let it be an integer. And it should not be now 
and it should be a primary key. Yeah. Then after this, you have to specify the course name. So similarly, you can just type in, let's assume that you'll be at most two five five characters long. So you can just specify that. And course name, obviously it should exist also. Yeah. And the last column we have is faculty. So in this case, it's also a string and it is an optional field. So we don't specify not now because it may not exist. Yeah. So remember to add the semicolon and just run it. Yeah. So over here you see that it's done. That means this operation is completed successfully. So after we created all our tables, we can just add data to our tables. So in this case, we'll just populate our students table first, followed by Android table and then the staff table. So over here you can see that for SQL indentation doesn't really matter to the interpreter. Over here in this example, after you run it, you can see that it tells you that how many rows are affected. Yeah. So in this case, in the first four examples, just shows you one row affected, and over here is a bulk operation, so just tell you it's done. Yeah. So now let's try exercise one point two. So I think now it's a bit. This exercise is a bit simp It's a bit simpler, and you're starting to get. It hang of it, so let's have a quick one. So I think one minute should be enough this time. Okay, if not, let's just go ahead and go through this example. So in this case, you just want to add a few courses into a database and you can do it the in bulk. So you just specify, use the syntax, insert into the table, which is courses. And you want to specify the columns that you want to insert into. So, yeah. so over here, you, you know that you're inserting into course course ID, uh, course name, and faculty. And let's do bulk insert, so you just specify, you can specify multiple rows at a time. Just remember to separate them with commas. So the first one you have is 12 and uh, computer science. Yeah, course under the faculty computing. Yeah. So. Yeah, so just go ahead and run the code that you have added and you can see that it shows you done. But up until this point, we don't actually know what the database looks like. So let's cover this next. And yeah, now let's try to see how we can read data from your database. So over here, we'll introduce the select statement. So in this case, you just need to, you'll be specifying what you want to retrieve from a table and the table or tables that you want to retrieve the you want to read from so in this case you can actually also apply standard arithmetic operators and other and various sql functions to the columns you select to manipulate the data that you have selected table this over here can be multiple tables but for this part let's just give it a single table first to simplify matters yeah so here's an example so in this case in the first example we'll use the wildcard operator to list all employees and their data so this is basically a shorthand for saying all the columns. So you don't need to list all of them out one by one. And this is pretty handy if you want to check that if that you have created a table correctly. Yeah. So over here, in a more complicated example where we list all the employees' names and salary in thousands. So over here, you see that we concatenate the first name and the last name together, separated by a space. And the salary, we, only, we divide by 1,000, so we just get only the yeah, fourth significant digit and above. So this actually shows you how you can manipulate data. And just a remark, concatenate has a slightly different syntax in SQLite and we'll show that later. Yeah. So after now that you can select data from the table, but what if some most of the time you don't actually want to dump the entire table? So in this case is where the where condition is actually pretty useful. This can help us to filter the data that we what we're retrieving using standard compar comparison operators, Boolean operators, and SQL operators. So after you have filtered the data, sometimes you still want to, you still don't want to retrieve all the all the entries that satisfy certain criteria. So in this case, you can use the limit and offset. What limit does is basically you limit it to n entries. So you only fetch n records. And offset basically well, offset will basically start counting the n records from m onwards. So m is zero index. 
So in this case, if you have five records and you limit two offset one, you'll start, you'll start, you'll, you'll, you'll retrieve the two to fourth record. Yeah. So because sometimes you also want to order the data you, you retrieve. So over here, you can use the order by. So you can use, you can do it both. You can do it, you can order data in both ascending and descending orders and by multiple columns. You just need to specify all of them here. Yeah. And yeah, this is done, applied after the limit is called. So the order does matter and you need to be careful with that. So here's an example. In this case, we want to list the employees who make more than 10K per month and are not managers or CEOs. So you just, in this case, you just want their first names and we can just do this. And we want to select where the salary is greater than 10K. So this is just a comp comparison operator. And over here, we use a Boolean operator and more Boolean operators. And over here, we use a, a SQL syntax in. So this is just a, a nicer way of saying where uh, and job title is not, it's like not manager and not CEO. So this can be really also if you have more than more criteria than just managers and CEOs. And we just want to sort them by department. So in another example, we list the employees who have the letter E as a second letter of that name. So we see the like, op like operator being used over here. Oh, I think it's a bit blocked. Okay, I just escape this. See the like operator being used and remember to include the quotes. Over here, you just want to specify that the first character can be anything and the percentage will just sign will just match an arbitrary number of characters. So it can be anything, can be nothing. So now uh, let's actually try part two of the exercises with this more, with, with now that we know how to query all the data. Yeah. So in the first example, we want to display all the data we have so far. So just go ahead and run all the cells. Yeah. Okay. There's nothing inside here. So maybe the select statement didn't, the insert statement didn't run properly. So let's, let me just run that previous, yeah, so. Yeah, so over here you can see the, all the students display over here. And over here we are listing all these statements one by one is because the plugin that we're using for IPython notebook only shows the output of the last statement. So if you put all this in one cell, you only see the output of uh, select star from stuff which is not what you want yeah so let's try a quick exercise let's try this thing all the students whose last name ends with n and this is the answer by the way so you can just go ahead and try it out so this is a simple one i think yeah one minute should be enough okay and i'll just go through this example so in this case you want to select all the columns so you can just go ahead and type select stuff from students and over here, we want, to, we want to filter by condition. So use the where state, where, cause, and you specify that the last name is like a string that ends with n. So in this case, you can just use this. Yeah, and yeah, you get the same output. So with SQLite, alternatively, we can also type the following into the, uh, is everything okay? Oh. I missed out the percentage. Yeah, the percentage is very important because if you specify, you don't specify this, you'll only match the students whose last name is exactly N. And that's not what you want. Yeah, because you only want this, we want all the students whose last name ends with N. Yeah, so let's move on to the next example. So if we're using the SQLite shell, we can use this following commands to show the table structures. But it doesn't really work here because this is not a complete, this is not a complete SQLite shell. So um, that's actually, and this is actually also a, a SQLite syntax for the most, for the more common syntax shown here, over here, which is used in other DBMS. So for example, in MySQL, you can use describe and wrote to show the table instead. Yeah, so over here, let's have another example. Let's try to this the second and third students in alphabetical order. Basically, you see, after sorting the students by alphabetical order, we want the second and third students. So over here, we just need to order the students by both the first name and last name since it's not really specified, we assume it's both. And 
over here, we want two students, so we'll name it two. And since we're start starting from the second student, we'll offset one because this is zero index, so we need to subtract one. Yeah. So just go ahead and run this, and you should get this output. So now let's have another quick exercise. We want to this the second student order alphabetically who has the letter O in his or her name. So this is quite a simple one. It's quite similar to the previous one. So I don't think you need, yeah, so I think 30 seconds is up. Does anyone need more time? Okay, so there's no response. So I just assume that you guys are fine. Yeah. I'll just go ahead and go through this exercise. So over here, you just select the second student. And so let's select from the table students where the letter O is in his or her name. So over here you can just you can use a here you can use a simple hack instead of comparing instead of doing where first name like something or last name like something you can just combine the first name and last name together. Yeah. So this is the syntax for the concat in SQL like it's slightly different, but just need to take just need to take all of it. And the letter O in the name, so you can there might be anything anything or nothing both in front or behind letter O. So just put the percentage sign in front, both in front and behind letter O. And you see a last condition is that we want the second student ordered alphabetically. Yeah. So among all these, you want to order them by the names. So you can just do it in a previous show in the previous example. And this query is getting a bit long so you can feel free to split it up onto separate lines. And you want a second student so just you're only picking one student so in this case you'll we'll limit one and since the second student you'll offset one. Yeah. Yeah so over here you will get this output. Okay so I think most of you are okay already so we can move on to the next part. So now let's look at more advanced queries. Yeah. So in this case, we, only sh we actually mentioned earlier that in the from part of the statement, you can select data across multiple tables. But over previously, we only see in the examples where we're only selecting from a single table. So to do that, one of, one of the ways using a newer syntax is to use this thing called inner join. So what inner join will do is that you'll basically match up rows of a, of the first of the first table that you have specified with the some rows of the second table that you have specified based on a certain condition. Yeah, and inner join will only return the rows where you can only return the rows of table one which has a match in table two according to the condition. So a very close relative of the inner join is the left join. So in this case, we'll all return all the rows in the first table, regardless of whether we can find a match in the second table. And the next example is thankfully much simpler. So the union, union clause will basically just stack the results of two queries together. And you might note that these columns must have the same data type because obviously we cannot combine apples and oranges. It just doesn't make sense. You need to remember that SQL, in all these select statements, what you're returning is essentially a table. So you must still follow the rules of SQL tables. That is, each column must have a fixed data type. Yeah. And just to finish, wrap all this theory up, before we move on to the examples, we also have the thing, a thing called aliases. So what aliases allow you to do is that basically you can use it to shorten queries and also to rename the columns in the output table. So in this case, we use the statement select column one as alias zero. That means instead of appearing as column one in output table, you will see alias zero instead. And over here, you can see that we can give an alias to table one and table two as well by using specifying alias right after the seed. So this can be very useful when you're typing the condition because you need to specify table dot column. Yeah. So to make all this clearer, let's look at some examples. So in the first case, we want to list the computer brands used by the employees. And we want to ignore all the employees without computers. So over here, we have our first table, which is the employee table. 
So this is a similar table from earlier, except now we actually have the computer model ID column. So we also have a second table over here, which is the computer models table. So you have the model ID, computer model ID, and you also have the brand of the computer model. So basically what you need to do is that you need to select the distinct brands from the, oh, there's actually no C dot here, there's a slight error. So from the employees inner join with the computer model C. So what on us on the, with the criteria that the computer model of the employee must be the same as the uh, ID of the computer model. So what this basically does is that, for example, let's look at the employee, first employee. Uh, his computer model ID is one. So you look at this table, you look at the CID of this table, which is, and find the row which has one inside. So which is this row. So you know the brand of the computer that John uses is the logo. So you just do this for at this, and you also do this for, yeah, the dust guy, and you get Novo and Acer. So in this case, Bob is ignored because you cannot cannot find a match for none in the CID of the computer models table. Yeah. What the union statement does is basically you stack the results of two queries together. So over here in our first query, we get the first names from employees, and in the second query, we have we get the first name from musicians. So in this case, both are, let's assume both are just variable character of 255, length, maximum length 255, so we just stack it together and that's okay. We can just get a final result like this. Yeah, so you note that John is actually only appears once in the final table despite appearing once in each, once in each query. This is because the union will automatically deduplicate the result. So if you don't want this behavior, you can just use the union or, and over here you can see that both of these appear. Yeah, so this part is a bit heavier, so let's just look, look through the exercises together and hopefully you'll make things clearer. Yeah. So over here we actually see a quite strange example that we didn't see in the slides. This is actually the older syntax for older syntax um, for in, like the joins and joins. So it basically does the same thing as Joining on joining where like the student ID is equal to a certain value specified and the code ID equals to something. So over here you select the the column's first name and last name from the resulting table, which is a Cartesian product of the students and enrolled, and according to this criteria. Yeah. So it's, if it's not very clear, you can just try go ahead and try running this statement first. So if you don't if you omit the where clause, what you see is that you have these entries appearing multiple times. So it's quite strange. Why do you have so many duplicate rows? So of course it's only it's because we're only selecting the first two columns. So there'll be a lot of duplicates. You appear to have a lot of duplicates despite having differences in other columns. Yeah. So let's go through this quick exercise. So you just want to get rid of the duplicates in a previous example and the code for this use case is actually shown in the slides earlier. And I think it's a quick one, so I won't start a timer. I'll just give you around 10 seconds to think of what it is. Okay, so over here is actually the same, it's actually uh, almost the same thing, except in this case, you will specify, select this thing. So in this case, you'll filter away all the rows that are duplicated. I haven't seen exercise 3.1.1. Point one point one. Oh. Okay, oh. this exercise, yeah, there's no coding involved. You just need to run this cell oh. and you'll see this result. Yeah. It's just for you to try out. Oh. Yeah, so it's actually about 1.2. It's just a very simple one. You just deduplicate the results using select this thing. So previously, uh, I mentioned that there's this thing called a Cartesian product generator. And yeah, over here is just some elaboration. A Cartesian product can basically be visualized as this. So what we're doing is that we'll create, we'll generate all the tuples where the first element in the tuple is from the first table and the second element in the tuple is from the second table. Yeah, so in this, uh, the combined table in exercise 3.1.1 will give us four times four, which is equal to 16 rows because each of the original tables have four rows. 
So each tuple will combine, will contain the attributes from enroll and students. So they're actually all distinct, but we don't see them because we're only citing the first two columns. And that's why we see so many duplicates. Yeah. So if you, if you can go ahead and try running this on your own, and you should see that the entire, uh, you should see the entire, uh, all 16, all 16 distinct rows if you run this. Yeah. So now going back to this example, we see that another alternative syntax for combined data, table data is to use joints. So over here, we can just select the table, the columns that we want in a resulting table from the, the table students, which we give an alias S. We'll interjoin this table with the table and row E, which will give an alias E on this criteria. Basically, we'll join the rows, we'll match each row in students with a row in and row where the student ID is found in the this row in and row. Yeah, and we'll only filter for the rows where the cost ID is equal to 12. Yeah. So yeah. If you run this, you'll be able to see a result. And if you're not convinced, you can go ahead and check the insert values earlier to see that this is actually the correct result. Yeah, so over here let's have a uh, Quick exercise that's query for the students and the names of their courses which are science related. Yeah. So over here you see that there's actually it's actually quite a complex query. So I think this one will take a should take a full minute. So I'll just give you guys one minute to try it out first. And if you need help, okay, I'll just go ahead. I'll just go ahead first since this is actually this example is also not simple. So you can come back and look at this after you after we go through next exercise also. So over here, you want to query for the students and the names of their courses, which are science related. So the first thing you do is to select the you want to select the name and the yeah want to select the first name and the concatenate it with the last name. So you can actually chain this concatenate together by just doing this, and you also want to select the course name. So over here, you can actually use an example. We can actually use the aliases because I'll just, I'll just run this first and I'll explain this later. Yeah. So you just do this and you'll select this from, after this, you want to build the combined table. So what you have is students and you want to inner join it with the, enrol the courses that they are enrolled in. So you can go ahead and give these two tables an alias. And the criteria is Whereas the student ID is, is equal to the, yeah. And because you also want the names of the courses, so you also need to um, join it with a third table. So it's quite a complex query. So you need to join it with the courses table as well. And this time you join it when the course ID is equal to the, yeah. And last thing, last thing you have to do is that you only want the courses which are science related. So over here, we'll assume that is the course name. So you can just filter for the course name is like science. And remember to add the wildcard and the front and the back. So if you run this, you will see that this first, first column appears quite ugly because you, it just gives the output of this. So what you can do is that you can give this an alias and let's just call this name. Yeah. So after you run this, you will see that this column is now nicely named as name. And this is quite easy to understand. Yeah. So over here we have our exercise. Next exercise, we basically want to list the courses and the IDs of the enrolled students, but for all courses. So even if a course doesn't have anyone enrolled in it, you still want to show it. So this is, this is still, um, so after seeing exercise 3.2, I hope that this one will be easier. So I'll just give you guys one minute to try this one as well. All right, so let's just go through this example. So over here, in this case, we want to list the courses and the IDs of the enrolled student. So this, in this case, let's just assume that the course name is good enough. So you can just select, go ahead and select course name and student ID from and after this we want to build the combined table so we'll select first we'll select the courses and now we want to know the 
arrow students. So we definitely need to involve the arrow table. Yeah. And because we want to do it for all causes, maybe inner join is not so suitable here. So we'll use left join instead. Yeah. So after this, you can go ahead and give both these table aliases to make the condition easier to type. And you want to join it based on the criteria that the cause ID is same as the ID in this enrolled table. And this is something we've seen already. Yeah. And after this, you just want to you want to know the student ID as well. So, because you only you want to know the student ID as well, you actually don't really need to specify, you don't need to specify the full student ID. You can just use the result in the enroll table. Yeah, so this is actually good enough. So if you run this, you should see this result. And over here, you see history has none because history the history course does not have anyone enrolled in it. Computer science has multiple students enrolled in it, so you see multiple results over here. So you can think of it as basically, this is just a nicer syntax for the Cartesian product, and you're still filtering the result of the Cartesian product. Yeah. So, and that concludes this part, and I hope you guys caught it. And if you guys need help or anything, you can still ask in the Discord chat. So let's just finish up the last part of this. So it's been quite a while, and that's... I hope you guys are looking forward to this. So now we actually have uh, this thing called subqueries. Basically, we want to nest a query inside another query. And you might think, when will this actually be useful? Well, it's actually you can use this to remove join conditions. And this makes the code much easier to read. And it also improves the performance of your queries. So it's a win-win situation. And another case that you can use this is when you want to model like complex relationships in your query or in your data. So let's just have a let's just have a simple example. So in this case, you want to list employees while earning more than Jim. So in in this case, the most intuitive way that to do this is to find out what's Jim's employee first, and you want to select employees whose salary is greater than that. And that's exactly what this subquery over here is doing. Yeah. So after this, we also have updating tables. So updating tables is. Pretty simple, you just need to specify the table name that you want to update. And you want to specify the columns that you want to update, as well as the new values that you want to assign to the column. So of course you don't have to update everything in the table, and that's where you can use the where condition. And you can also use all these modifiers, which we have explained earlier. So in this context, what this does is basically, they are used to select the rows that you want to update. So they perform a very similar function, except that instead of just merely selecting the rows, in this case, you will modify the rules. To delete the data, you can wipe the table by using delete from and just don't specify anything, you delete all the contents of that table. Or if you want to have a more controlled delete, you can specify the rules you want to delete using the where and using all the modifiers that you had learned earlier. In this case, the data is deleted but the table still exists. But let's say if you're really, really sure that you really don't want this table anymore and you're not going to use it ever again, or you, read, or you just want to recreate a table, you can just go ahead and nuke the table with drop table. You can, yeah. Oh, uh, over, over here it's not if not exists, it's if exists. Because some if you try to drop a table that does not exist, it will also show an error. So over here, let's have a simple example where we're promoting the employees. So over here, let's say we want to promote, we have a very weird criteria. So maybe we're in the Acer company, I, I don't know. And we want to promote employees who are very loyal to the company. So we'll select the employees who use a computer model that is from Acer. So to do that, you just need to find the I computer the IDs of all the of the computer models whose brand is Acer. And you just need to check whether the computer model ID of used by this of the computer used by this employee is in that list. And you just promote this employee to manager. So this is just a nice example combining everything that we have, almost everything that we had learned earlier. Yeah. So now let's try the last and final part of this exercise. And this one is quite short. So I'll just go, I'll just go through the examples as we go along. So in the first exam exercise, we have one of the students changing his last name. So you can just update that. Yeah. After you update, you should get, and you run the select this statement, you should be able to see this final output table. So let's go ahead and give it a try. OK, 
Okay, I'll just go through it now. So basically what you will do is that you update the students table and you want to set the last name is equal to writing, which is the new last name. And the criteria is where the, in this case, I just assume that there's only one George, but this, this isn't usually a bad practice. So you should probably have a more robust check for this up. So you just want to check where the, you want to do this where the first name of the student is George and you can just go ahead and run this query. Oh wait. Oh yes, you need to include the codes. Just be careful with this. Yeah. And over here you can see the updated table. George is now George writing. Yeah. And let's look at the next example. This one is also quite simple. We just want to remove a certain row from the database because this person has retired. So over here, uh, you can just go ahead and try it and try it. So I'll just give you around 10 seconds. Yeah. Yeah, so you can, what you can do, you just delete from the staff where the staff name is equal to prof by. Yeah, so it's a very simple example. And over here, you just show you that there's only one staff def and that's prof tan. And this is a more challenging example. So you have to do this operation without using any joins. So it's actually a very good one to consolidate what you have done about subqueries. So do give it a try. Uh, for this one, I think you need a bit more time. So I'll just give you one minute for this. Okay, if not, let's just go ahead and go through it. So in this case, you want to remove the students. So it's because you to when you're, when you're writing out a statement, in this case, you can always use a select to check first whether you're removing the correct students and just need to replace it later. So let's just use select first to see what we're removing. So the first criteria is that uh, these are computer science students. Yeah. And because this question states that you're not allowed to refer to the course ID shown earlier, you only know that they are computer science students. So the first thing you have to know is that you have to find out the student IDs of these students. So to find out the student IDs of these students, you have to know that the, you have to know the exact course ID that, that is um, sh the course ID of the computer science course. So you want to select this from students where the student, I'll just type this in first, where the student ID is in, and over here let's have your first subquery. So you want to have all the student IDs which are in the enrolled table where the course ID is the computer science course, but you don't know what the computer science course ID is. So over here, you can have your second subquery and you just need to select the course ID from the courses where the course name is equal to computer science. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just break this so it's easier to see. And over here, you see the two students. So you can just go ahead and delete the students by changing the slide to delete. Yeah. yeah. So now if you run the this statement, you will be able to see that. There's only these two students left. And know that um, if the students don't exist, there actually is no error shown, shown over here. And the last example is very simple because you just want to let go all the stuff and with you just want to let go all the stuff you can just do a simple drop table stuff um, and you know i have finished copying exercise 4.3 okay okay oh, i just leave it here I've so you can see I've got a never mind you can go on okay sure sure yeah so the last exercise is just 
you can just do a simple drop table. But note that over here, if you try to select Sorry, from error. this table again, you get an error. So for over here, we just see that, let's just finish going through the last exercise. So over here, you see that if you want to select from this table, this you will just get an error because this table is completely destroyed by the drop table stuff. So if you, want, if you don't want to do this, you have to use the delete from stuff. And at the end of this notebook, there are some extra related code for the styles. So if you're interested, you can play around with it, but I won't be going through it further. Yeah. So it has, just to wrap this all up, there are many uh, resources out there that you can look at for SQL and SQLite. And here's a, one example. So let's look, just go around, there's actually a lot of great resources. And so now I'll be passing the time back to Kenneth to talk about how to integrate SQL into your Flask app. Okay, so now that we've kind of learned like some of the queries in your um, SQL, right? If you still have any errors or problems, uh, just feel free to say in the workshop help. Uh, the, the other facilitators will answer your questions. Okay, so anyway, so next up, we will need to kind of create a database for our Flask app. Uh. So, um, there's actually many ways to do this. Uh. Um, especially in production, there's quite a few like ways. Uh. But for today's purposes, um, we're going to make use of something, um, a website that actually I found. Uh. So it's, okay, I, I don't know whether it's, it's so-called production ready, but um, for today's purposes, you can make use of this thing called SQLite Online IDE. Uh. Basically, you can execute SQL queries uh, from the online IDE. So go ahead and click on the link. Um, if let's say you want to use it for like um, on your own local computer, you can go ahead and click on DB Browser for SQL. Like, it's a a website that should kind of help you with the like it gives you a nice IDE for you to kind of look at all of your um, data la. So you can go ahead and download it, but after this course la. But for today's purposes, we don't really need that. Okay, so once you guys click on the link you can you'll see this nice page over here la. so what you can go ahead and do is go to the table there and click on drop table yeah just click on drop table you realize that there's some good um nice buttons that you can click just to delete away the table la. yeah okay so once you have this page here uh, what i'd like you guys to do now is to create a simple table for your task so We'll make use of a create table command. Uh, you can just watch me and copy it later. If not exist, um, task. Then our. Oops. Then, after that, I'll I'll just keep this table simple for today's uh whatever. So, I'll likely have probably have a name, something like John, for instance, as well as some task that I want to for him to see, right? Okay, I won't care about description for today, just name and task. So I'll probably create a name where a name field with text, uh input type of text, and also not now, because um I want to keep track of his name. And I also have a task. Got Okay, so once you guys are done, you can go ahead and run this. Click on run at the button at the top over here. Maybe let me try to make my screen a bit bigger. Okay, yeah. So you can see over here at the top, click on run. You will uh, click on the, if you click on the table, you won't see anything yet. Lah. So what we need to do next is we need to insert some values into our table. So I'll Go up and write insert into task name, comma task. So this is kind of like the main table name. This will be the few tasks and I mean a few name as well as the few tasks. And I have a bunch of values. Uh I'll put John and buying book. Yeah, and I'll go ahead and close away this delete this previous query because I've already executed it. Yeah. So I'm gonna insert into this and I'm gonna remember put a semicolon and then run it as well. Okay, then now I want to show everything for my table. So I'll click select all from pass. Yeah, I click run. So you'll see I have a very nice table here with a name and task. Very simple table. So 
next one I'm going to do is I'm going to download my item. So I'm going to export it as a database. So if I go up to the top over here, you'll see file. I click on save DB. Save DB. And then I'll click OK. And I'll just save it in my downloads folder. I can call it anything. But for today's purposes, I'll just call it data.db. Okay. So um, if you all need the code here, uh, let me just see. I can show you guys the history. Yeah, my code and the history is over here. Okay, so right now, right, if I go back to the slides, right, um, once I've done created my database, right, um, okay, then next, what I need to do is I probably need to connect to my database from my web app. So I'll need to import SQLite 3, which is the um, Python module, which is in charge of connecting to the database. And then I'll create a connection as well as a cursor object, which allows me to execute things with the database. And then I will execute some commands. Uh. So for instance, if let's say I wanted to get a name from, from a database, let's say I wanted to check if let's say uh, John is a registered user in my to-do list or uh, my Momentum web page. Okay, by the way, if you don't know what's Momentum, it's just a add-on to make your web pages look nice. I mean like, it's a Chrome extension to to greet you every day when you join the web browser. Okay, anyways, so back to the point. So let's say if you wanted to select a name from like your database, you can select name from users where name is equal to something. And because most likely you will have a changing name, right? Like let's say each time a different user logs onto your account, say John, say um, Isaac, or any, any person's name, it will change, right? So we'll have a variable inside here. And we'll make sure to enclose the variable inside a, like a tuple. But if let's say we have more than one parameter that we want to pass into our SQL query, let's say we have a name as well as an ID or password or something, then we will make sure to have a tuple with two values. Huh? If you have one value, make sure to have, notice the difference, you make sure to have a comma at the end. It's just one of those uh, kind of problems you can say with uh, SQL syntax. Huh? Yeah. The other way is actually you can also make use of the percent uh, syntax, but for today's purposes, we won't really be looking at it. So yeah, percent syntax uh, and the is it percent yeah percent yeah. Then after that, we will connect to the we will commit our connection. So we call so we make sure that the query is being sent to the database and make sure to close the connection once you're done. So if you want to execute multiple queries. What you do is after this commit, you continue having cursor.execute, cursor.execute over here. So over here will be cursor.execute and all the other stuff. Lah. Yeah. Then after that, at the end of everything, you will close the connection because this is very important. Lah. If not, other other um, queries cannot like use the database if you don't close. Yeah. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna translate this code into into something that I can do with my web page. Ah. So firstly, what I'll do over here is let me import SQLite 3. So I will import, import SQLite. Import. Yeah. Then um, once I'm done importing the module, let's say if I want to showcase the task belonging to someone's name, ah, what I will do over here is I will first connect to the database. So over here at task, okay, I will first connect to the database. Then I will have create a connection. To the name of my database. So this is fill up the name with the corresponding database name. Ah. So for me just now, if you, um, See over here, you realize that, oh, whoops, let me go to the right folder. You realize that my database is called data.db. You can call it another name, whatever the name it is. So do that correspondingly. So for me, it's data.db. So I'll call it data.db. And then after that, I'll initiate a cursor object. So cursor equals connection dot cursor. And then after that, I will get tasks assigned to this individual. So I'll just create a random variable 
I mean like not random lah, like a uh, arbitrary variable that I'll be using for my connection lah. So it'll be cursor dot execute. Uh, select um task from. Okay, if you're wondering, um, just now, um, when Li Li Chen demonstrated the the stuff he used, like small letters are, but um, for like in this Python, the convention is to use capital letters for like this uh, yeah. But I think small letters should still work uh, But yeah, just try and use capital capitalized letters. So then where name is equal to question mark, which is the formatting, and comma. Um, some variable that we're putting over here. La. Okay. So you'll be wondering what's the variable I've been putting. So previously, we remember in the previous session we made use of a, something called a session variable over here. So we will need to similarly make use of this session variable. So we need to get the name from the session variable. So what I'll do is I'll create a new get session variable. And then I'll go to uname is equal to session uname. So now that I have this name over here, I will go ahead and place this variable that I've gotten. So this session variable is basically the name of the user who entered the name when he first entered the web page. Huh? So assuming John, when he first enters the web page, this will be his name uh, and it's stored inside this session variable and then i'll be getting his name from the session variable so that i will enter his name inside here so so i'll be selecting all the tasks from tasks so this will be the name i mean name of the table followed by the field and then followed by the name his name and then i will task i'll create a task list to fetch all from the query. Okay, so if I were to print task list, then remember I'll commit the connection. If let's say if I were to restart this again, and if I were to run it, I click on see my task. Oh wait, I haven't added the database. Okay, wait, so go ahead and add your database. Upload your database. Okay, then um, if I were to run it, see your task, you realize over here that, slow down. You realize over here that when I print out the array of task list, oh my, oops, give me a moment. Okay, when I print out the array task list, right, you realize it is an array with a tuple and a string inside a tuple, and there's a comma at the end. So, how are we gonna get this value out? So, we probably need to make use of array indexing. So, um, array indexing is basically okay. So, once I have my thing loaded, I probably want to segment out the tuple only. So, I'll add a zero. To the end. So what this does is basically I am segmenting this um like the first element in the array, which is the tuple. Then from there, I I can actually go and um like do it one more step and then have another zero to just to get this value. But what if let's say this guy has many tasks, like he has more than one task in my in his um, to do list. Uh, so for today, I'm not really going to do that. I'm just going to have this. And just going to have uh, a task list like that. And what instead I can do is make use of Jinja. So if you guys have forgotten what Jinja is, Jinja is basically the templating language for you guys to, um, that comes with Flask, which allows you to um, create dynamic web pages to create the, like, have things that change dynamically with your website. So how am I going to do that? I'm going to pass in the, another variable called task list. And this variable over here will later be passed to the HTML web page, as you'll see in a short moment. It will be passed to the HTML web page, and I will iterate through this list over here, I mean this uh, um, tuple, using Jinja. So go ahead and write down this line first in your 
render template. Okay, so once you guys are done writing down the name, I'll go over to my task.html. And you will see I have my old tasks over here. But these are all not static. These are all, I mean, these are static. So these are like, they don't change dynamically. So I'm going to go ahead and comment out everything. In HTML, I can, if you remember, you comment using a exclamation mark and a dash dash. So yeah. So I've commented out everything. And what I'm instead going to do is I'm going to use a Jinja for loop. So I'll create a table row with a table heading known as task. Remember to close your brackets. And then I will close the table heading with a table row. And for and using a Jinja for loop, the syntax is a percent sign at the end and at the start. Oops. So it'll be like that. The, there's only one bracket, not two brackets. Uh. Just be careful. So I'm going to use a Jinja for loop. So for item in task list, US is actually pretty similar to Python. I'll have an iter iterable to iterate through the array, the tuple that we have sent previously to the HTML page. Up. OK, then I'll create a table row with a table data item. So I'll encapsulate this inside a Jinja variable. And I'll close the table data. And then I'll close the table row. Then in Jinja, we'll make sure to close up the for loop. So n for. So once you are done, you will have this um, syntax over here. I'll give you guys some time. That's 354. I'll give you guys a 356. Just um, copy down this line. Off. So if you realize if it works right, it should, when you type your name, when you type the person's name that you had ha entered previously in the SQL database, if his name was already inside, if you click see my task, you should see a task and his corresponding item over here. So this will adjust accordingly based on your database. Huh? So that's the cool thing about this SQL thing. So now you're really starting to see the power of Jinja. Lah. Like it can really make use of, um, it can really help to, run you can integrate very well with your sql statements okay so yeah, you need to like import jinja uh no jinja is not uh you don't have to import it it's actually um it comes with flask say can think of it as that way yeah. well so this works right for selecting names for a database but we haven't implemented the inserting of names right yeah so there's definitely quite a lot of other stuff to add for your to-do list uh. There's the part where you need to insert people's names into your database. So you probably need an insert statement. And you'll probably also have a form name. So this form might have um have multiple tables. Because just now the database I created only at one table, right? So I'll probably have more tables. And I'll use primary keys to kind of identify them. So that's where all your SQL knowledge comes in again. Uh. Yeah, so um I'm not gonna go through everything uh because uh, we're running short of time already, but um, after the workshop, you can go ahead and continue to improve on your to-do list. Uh. Like make use of all the statements that you guys have learned just now. To create insert statements, delete statements, to allow people to create tasks and delete tasks accordingly. Yeah. Okay, so before I wrap it up, I have a bunch of things that I like to say. So, in SQL, there's, there are some drawbacks which uh, as a developer or a budding developer, you should be kind of aware of. Uh. So the first one is SQL injection. So for those of you guys who don't really know what SQL injection is, or if you didn't attend the cyber security workshop, SQL injection basically is what happens when um, a developer make use of a certain statement. Let's say they have a select statement for their form. Like over here, I have a form, right? They had a select task from something where name is equal to this. And what happens is that if you inject certain statements inside this query, you can kind of cause the query to become like malicious. Uh. So how this works is, um, if we take a look at my at this website over here, 
I have this um, nice website with an input box. So what happens is, let's say they probably have a statement behind that says, select something from your name where name is equal to certain comma. And what I can do is manipulate that, that statement. So if I end it off with a single quote, and then I create a true statement, a true statement over here, what I can do is I can basically kind of um, create if select all from your names where name is equal to something and I close the bracket because you know the input is most likely wrong or true so it will usually event the whole statement will always evaluate the true if you think about it so where is it uh, over here so if you have this statement and if I input this, what happens is that this statement actually goes into this thing and it closes the bracket. So it equals to this or this, and then it closes the statement. So this will create a true statement permanently. So if I have a true statement, what do you think will happen? I will get, I'll be able to basically leak the whole database. Yeah, so um, this is actually a uh, cybersecurity challenge. Uh. Like it's a simple one, uh. but that it kind of shows you kind of some of the problems with SQL. Uh per se. And definitely there are ways to get around this, but um, in general, that's one of the drawbacks of SQL. Okay, another thing is um, the fact that SQL is one transaction at a time. So what does that mean? Let's say if I have a lot of users trying to use a certain website at a certain time, like you know the uh, amazing ways that you guys played on during the building blocks event. So if you have a lot of people trying to use the same website at the same time, what happens is that you have a lot of select and you have a lot of queries to the database at the same time. And then sometimes you might have, you might come across where suddenly you get an error because it cannot really take so many queries at once. Yeah, because you need to close the connection and so on. So that's where this one transaction at a time comes from. Yeah. And the database will be locked until the transaction is committed. So that's kind of the problem. Yeah, it cannot retrieve values if the database is locked. So there are some alternatives to this whole thing. Uh. So there's um, Postgres SQL, which uses a OOP kind of like syntax, yes, classes to kind of manage your database. And there's my SQL also. But some of these, they also use a SQL like syntax. And there's also no SQL databases, such as MongoDB, which um, is the workshops over already, but I can still watch the YouTube video online. Uh. Yeah. So these are some of the alternatives. So uh, with that, I come to the end of the session. I know it's been a long day. Yeah. So um, if you guys have any questions, just uh, ask in the workshop chat. Yeah. Thanks so much.